Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Whether you're watching live, listening to the podcast, or watching on YouTube, we're so glad that you're here. We are going live, of course. It's what we do here on the Visual Lounge, and we're so grateful for you guys tuning in today. We've got a great guest today. So today, we're going to be talking about customer education, and that's a there's a lot we could talk about customer education. But fortunately, we've got the the right person to talk about it with because he has so much great experience. So let me introduce our guest for today. Daniel Quick brings over 20 years of experience designing, learning, delivering training, and building customer education programs. Daniel is responsible for leading industry research, product education, and L&D teams, and is focused on communicating valuable best practices with the broader community. Before joining Thought Industries, Daniel was a game designer and entrepreneur. Most recently, he led customer education at Optimizely, Culture Amp, and Asana. Daniel is passionate about creating exceptional learning experiences and delighting customers. And he's a delightful person, and I'm so grateful that I've gotten to know him a little bit. So if you'll join me, please welcome Daniel Quick to the Visual Lounge. Welcome, Daniel. Hi, Matt. It's great Hi. to be here. It's, thank you for having me. It's, it's really awesome to be on your podcast. Well, it's it's so glad that I'm so glad to be able to, to have you here. You know, it's it's. I think we we first met in an education event, a customer education event, and you know, it's just been uh, fun watching your the work that you're doing. It's fun to get to know you and see all the great things that you're doing. And so, uh, you know, as I've been bringing guests on, your name's been top of the list, and just finding the right opportunity has been been really good. So, uh, awesome, jump, yeah. It's. Okay. I was just gonna say we've we've gotten to know a little uh, each other a little bit more and. Turns out we have some things in common, and maybe we'll talk about that. Maybe we won't, but yeah, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. So you know, I, I love reading people's bios and talking about what they do. But is there anything else as we go into this that we should know about about you? Well, I live in the the Bay Area, and um, I uh, <laughs> I have two dogs. So you you and I were talking about this earlier, and they this is one of those like. Um, you know, one of the, the great um, changes of my life really in the last year is that I work from home now. And it's actually kind of a permanent thing for me now. So you may hear my um, my roommates make some noises um, eventually. But yeah, other than that, um, I, I love education. I love technology. I love games and really was looking for a career that allowed me to kind of combine all of my interests together, allow me to be creative, allow me to really focus on, on learning, but incorporate um, technology and um, ways to sort of like drive engagement. And so uh, I really kind of landed on this customer education thing. And um, it was pretty quickly that I realized it was a really awesome career for me. It fit all my interests. So um, yeah, and what, what can I tell you? That's It's one of those things like, you know, it took me a while to get here um, in my career. I've had several different careers, in fact, uh, but I feel like I'm at the right place now. Oh, that's that's awesome to hear. And we're we're glad you're here because we're only benefiting from it, like that you've made your path to it. Well, let's start really high level because I think um, you know, customer education as a term is is fairly new. Like I feel like it's been something I've been doing for a long time, but I I I definitely did not call it customer education. Like uh, you know, way back when I had a different I think I was customer engagement manager or something like that. Mm. Like there's been lots of names. So kind of at a high level. How would you explain what customer education is to anyone who might listen to this or watch this that's like, well, what is what is customer education? What does that even mean? Yeah, it's, it's a really great question. Um, so I, I think of customer education as a, um, a, a function um, uh, to help our customers, and I include prospects in there or anyone that's really um, would would find value in our product. Prospects are just customers in waiting after all. So to help them uh, really get the most value from uh, from our products. And um, in order to do that, you really not only have to, I think conventional thinking is like, we need to make sure that we have a really great plan to train our customers on how to use the product. Like, you know, what do you, what are all the things you need to know in order to like use this particular product? And those are definitely important things for to, to teach uh, customers. But also um, the other thing I, I'm really passionate about is just thinking, kind of taking a step back and thinking about the customer's job and, and what job they hired your product to do. And, you know, how you can provide education um, and you know, training to your customers in a way that will build their skills in the role that they have, 
so that they can get the most value from your product. Um, so it's not just about product training, it's also about building skills and expertise and, and enabling your customers in, in their careers. Yeah, I, I, I love that. I mean, personally, because I think that's what we, we try to do with at TechSmith, but I, I love that because it's, it's, it's that, you know, it's like, yes, of course you need to know how to use the product, but we really want you to be able to be broader than that. So I think that's it's really good. So for for you, Daniel, and I, you know, I know you've come from different industries, right? Like you've seen different sides of the world, and you've seen different companies. For someone to be successful or, or or good at customer education, what what are kind of baseline skills that you think they should just have? Because for me, mm -hmm. I'm an instructional designer. You know, that's why I, I did my master's degree in instructional design, but. I, I think I'm biased in that sense, but for you, what, what kind of skills do you think make for good at customer education people? So I think above all else, um, it's really important that you are passionate about learning, um, that you're passionate about education. Um, and I, you know, I think that sort of manifests in different ways. C certainly uh, a, a lot of people I have interviewed for customer education roles um, have um, demonstrated their passion in, in education in, diff in you know, either through um, educational psychology or instructional design. So they have some knowledge of like learning theories, adult learning theories. Um, but I've also seen people demonstrate that through um, training and training delivery and really just loving sort of that, that moment when they're standing in front of people and they're talking about something and that light bulb moment goes off with people in the audience. Like that's, they're really passionate about that moment. Or I've talked, uh, I've, I've talked to a lot of people who are teachers, former teachers. Um, so, you know, above all else, I just think it's really important that you have a passion and, and interest um, and curiosity about learning and, and what are best practices when it comes to learning. Um, above that, I think that, you know, customer education is really in this unique uh, position of sort of being at the intersection of different uh, functions in a business. You know, you've got the learning thing going on, you've, but you've also got um, you've got to keep in, in mind the, the business as a whole, like the the marketing strategy, your customer success strategy, um, product development. There's it touches so many different functions, which is one of the reasons why I actually love this career because I'm like working with so many different teams. And I get to wear so many different hats, um, but I do think it calls for uh, someone to have some level of sophistication with business um, business acumen, um, really sort of understanding how all the different pieces fit together, um, an ability to understand how to scale um, different programs. So I think that's a that's a requirement that I uh, that I also look for as well. Yeah, and I, I I love that too. That I think one of the things I found when I was just making learning content is. It, it gets kind of like repetitive. It was kind of the same things over and over. Uh, so I love that you said that this idea that you're at this intersection, right? Like, because it is a really, there's a relationship to marketing. There's a relationship to your customer success and sales teams. There's a relationship directly to the product even, right? Like those interactions. And I think uh, to me, that's super, super interesting. And I appreciate you, you pointing that out. But with all that, there's got to be some kind of big high level challenges that are, are facing people in customer education right now. And I know we're talking generally right now, and I'm sure, you know, when you talk to your team, there's some very specific things, but I'm kind of just generally here, Daniel, what are some of the big challenges you think customer education professionals are facing right now with making this successful? Because um, it's interesting. I see there are a couple of communities that we're, we're part of. I see like lots of job postings for customer education. And so it's, it looks like, at least from that very narrow lens, it looks like a growing industry, lots of opportunity, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. there's a lot of challenges too, because I don't, I mm -hmm. don't know if it's everything set yet. Like, I don't know if anyone's come up like, this is the definitive way to do customer education and there may never be, but I'm, I'm just curious from your perspective, key challenges, big challenges you think yeah. we're all facing. Yeah, you know, uh, that was a, a question I asked um, a lot of people recently. Um, I, I had the, the privilege of, of interviewing um, a, a good 30 or so customer education leaders. Um, and one of the questions I like literally asked these people were, what, what are some of the biggest challenges facing customer education professionals today? And um, <clears throat> I heard, um, you know, I heard a number of things, but the, the thing that I heard over and over again 
was that uh, there was a real challenge in demonstrating the impact of the work that we do. Um, how do I, you know, how do I connect the dots between um, designing a learning experience, iterating and improving that experience, um, you know, conducting some sort of training? How do I connect the dot to those activities and to like the, the, the business as a whole, the business metrics, you know, renewals and churns and expansion and product adoption, those kinds of things that would really help um, convey the impact of, of my team and of the things that my team is focusing on. And that is a really big challenge. Um, and we can talk a little bit about why that's a challenge if you like, um, but it's, it's, it's got a lot of um, important um, and significant um, consequences when you have sort of this challenge that I think a lot of us can relate to where you have, uh, you know, where, you, where it's difficult to demonstrate the impact of your work. You have to just work all the harder to make a case for greater investment in your team, to grow your headcount, to grow your portfolio, um, not to mention just really, um, getting you know other people in your organization really excited about the work that you're you're doing which i think is a really critical thing you you need to be thinking about is is really evangelizing your work the work of your team and getting others really bought into it not only so that they understand the impact themselves of your team but also so that they can you know figure out how they can contribute you know if if they're excited about it, maybe they'll be willing to help out with um some article or or moderate a discussion or, or lead a training session. Um, so these are all, all really important things um, that I think sometimes get lost in the mix when you have a really difficult time demonstrating the impact of the work that you're doing. Yeah, so you, you brought up the, the happy to talk about why, because um, it does seem like this is an ongoing problem. It's been a problem for a long time. I think a, a lot of, and not just customer education, but I think a lot of learning professionals, people working internally, people working externally, it's, it's hard to, to kind of show that value. Um, you know, you have to do it, but like, what, what's our, you know, it's not an easy answer to all the questions. So from your perspective, Daniel, what have you seen like that either why that's been such a problem or are there things that people can do? Or are there things that like we should be thinking about? Because my guess is it's not a problem you can solve in five minutes. Because uh, mm -hmm. if, it, if it was easy, we'd all just go and solve it. But I, yeah. I am curious about, from a, your perspective in dealing with you know customer multiple customer education programs, what you've learned. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, a number of things come to mind. Um, first, uh, it's it's so it's it's important that you know when you're when you're setting out to um, execute your customer education, you. You know, you really need to have a strategy, and that strategy you need to you need to define the goals of your program, and you need to align them with the objectives of your business. And you need to have an understanding of how your business defines success and how your customers define success. And so, one reason why I think um, people have a challenge is because they, uh, you know, they they may have not thought enough about ex explicitly how. Uh, their team is going to focus on on initiatives and projects that will directly align to the goals of the business so that they can more easily uh, connect the dots and you know they make it harder for themselves by doing things that are sort of peripherally related to the goals of the business right now so that's the first thing I will say the second thing is that um, you know there are a lot of confounding variables when it comes to something uh, some metrics that are that are fairly downstream. When you when you when you think about renewals, for example, and churn, um, there are a lot of variables that lead into that. And so, you know, if a lot of people will recommend, and myself included, I, I strongly recommend this um, to take a look at your two different cohorts: cohorts that have been trained and cohorts who have not been trained. And do a simple uh, correlation between those cohorts and um, metrics like renewals and, and churn and product adoption. And you will likely find, as I have every single time I've done this, that there is a significant correlation between training and um, a healthy customer, a customer that renews, a customer that gives you a good NPS, et cetera. Um, and that's a really wonderful metric to have. But... It is, I think we need to acknowledge that it is a, is it is a correlation. Um, I, I was sort of like singing at the top of the roof about these correlations at Asana because they were really significant. Um, and Asana being a very data-driven organization, 
you know, was kind of lukewarm about that. They were like, well, yeah, but there's a lot of different things. I mean, like, you know, the customer who is more likely to renew um, is going to be the customer who's going to enroll in the training class because they're the ones who like really have a problem to solve. They're really enthusiastic about the, the, the product. Um, so it doesn't really, it's not really, a, since it's not a causal relationship, it could be one way or the other. So I think it's a really important to have those correlations. And, and I personally don't feel like, um, you know, we, we as learning professionals really need to doubt the impact of the work we're doing. I think we all know that this, this work is incredibly important and, and even critical to the success of our business. And I think some of us are really lucky to have executive sponsors who also know that, but it's still really important, I think, for us to have ways to, to really see clear um, causal relationships between the activities we do uh, to our programs, in our programs, customer education programs, and our, our business so that we can, um, you know, show all the kinds of charts and, and, um, and you know, uh, visual data to really sell, uh, sell that story and, and get additional investment and, um, and get people excited about our program. So I think the, the data piece is a really important one. And, and, I, and I believe strongly that that data should it, it shouldn't be a matter of customer education professionals trying to hunt it down it should really be up to vendors like thought industries to really provide that data uh for our for our customers so that they can more easily understand the impact of what they're doing you know i'm i'm quietly chuckling to myself because of all the things that you were just talking about these are all conversations <laughs> i've had inside of TechSmith about well i i know it's not causation but a strong correlation and here's the, here's how these things connect, you know? And so I, I think it's a really, it's a really great point. And let me ask you this, Daniel, and maybe there's not a good answer. And I don't, I don't want you to feel like you have to have a good answer for this is if, if you could magically wave a wand, right? This is a kind of a product product manager type question, right? If you could magically wave a wand and have one piece of information that would tell you if your, your customer education program is doing a good job, it's working, is there one that you would like, yes, that's the one I would go after. That's the one I'd want to know. Well, um, I mean, the, the, the one that there, there's several that come to mind, and I think it will depend a lot on your customer education strategy. And many programs um, will focus on one strategy before they can focus on others. Um, often the first strategy they will focus on is um, how to create uh, uh, education, often in the form of like knowledge base articles that will help scale your support team and deflect support tickets. Because as you grow as a business, uh, your your support tickets will also grow and it's really not scalable to just continue to hire support agents uh, to handle those tickets. And so customer education can play a really big role in deflecting those support tickets. Um, so it would be really amazing, for example, to have an understanding of the top, just right in your dashboard, um, in your um, in, in your learning platform, wherever you're doing your work, to have um, an understanding of the most common pain points, the most common areas of friction that your customers are facing as they might be categorized by your support ticket uh, program. And um, to be able to um, maybe even segment who in your customers, like according to sort of their persona who is particularly struggling with these issues and then to create a learning um, uh, sort of a, a, a learning experience uh, an intervention of some kind and uh, write all in the same place in your learning platform send that learning experience to your to that particular segment and watch over the next couple weeks uh, the support tickets, change like really that you're hoping that that category would begin to decrease you will see other types of pain but that particular pain will will resolve or at least be minimized somewhat and you can clearly see like okay that it that started taking place the moment that i launched this particular intervention and there's a clear connection here between the work i'm doing and and this particular issue in our business i mean those those are the kinds of of metrics that uh, we should, I think, in, as, a, as, a, as our field becomes more sophisticated and as our technology and, and the data streams that we become that become more integrated, 
um, I think we should expect to see those kinds of um, you know, clear uh, metrics that help you understand the impact of your work on the business. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that. And, uh, you know, so one of my experiences at TechSmith is I, I, I've actually run our support team. I was the manager for the support team for a while. And so I remember that, that, that call for help, right? Like, okay, we can't, we're not getting more headcount but we need to deflect some more of these issues because of just the call volume and the, the chat volume and all those things. And so what a, what a great, what a great thing to be looking at. And it, I love that you said like, we could basically, ex there are ways to experiment with that, right? Like figuring that out. So I think that's, that's really totally a great thing. Yeah. There's a, there's a, there's another example that I'm really excited about too. If you, you don't mind me chatting a little bit more yeah. about this. Um, so then the, uh, another strategy that is really um, that a lot of people are probably thinking about in customer education is how to um, how to reduce the consumption gap in your product. So there there are probably features that you think and you know are really valuable um, and can provide a lot of valuable value to your customers, but for whatever reason your your customers really aren't engaging with those features and. So I think it would be really amazing. Um, you know, we're, we're thinking a lot about this in thought industries, like how we can leverage all the pieces are there. It's really just about connecting them. Um, so for example, we, we, um, we use this awesome uh, software called can do to provide these in product dashboards um, that we can change the content without bothering our developers. And we can promote a, um, a video, for example, from like that tells you all about this new this feature and how awesome it is and how it's going to really become value valuable for you. And we can also promote that to specific segments. We can even run an experiment really to to show this to some people, but not to other people on on the dashboard. And, and then we have heap also hooked up so we can really we have really deep understanding of product analytics. And we can see like for those who, you know, were shown this video, what, what does product consumption and this particular product feature look like compared to those who didn't. So all of those, like they're, they're there, it's all the data is there, all the, all the, all the things are in place. It's really, I think just a matter of um, bringing them all together and providing a, a way for, I'm always thinking about autonomy. How can customer education professionals have autonomy to be able to really dig into these issues without all these dependencies on your biz tech team or your data science team or teams that might be like, mm, you're like 20th in line. I'll, I'll get to you in a moment. <laughs> so <laughs> right. that's what I'm thinking about a lot. Yeah. Well, I love that. And I, 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 uh, I, I love the kind of this, the ideas here. And I think that's probably a key to any good customer education program is a lot of, a lot of experimenting, a lot of trying things, bringing things together. You know, I, I feel like I've, put more than one program together, just trying to, you know, like, oh, what, what happens if we can mash these things, you know, get some duct tape out. Um, you mentioned, you brought up using video in that you're kind of on your dashboard. And I want to, we are the visual lounge after all. So we want to, we want to shift a little bit to talk about video. Before we do that, though, there, there there's a question here I want to make sure. Uh, I don't know if we'll have a great answer for him, but I want to make sure we're responding to the, to our audience here. Uh, and this is on over on YouTube, the right price real estate group is asking and or kind of says at first, I'm trying to set up lesson plans. Is it an education software that works best with Camtasia Snagit? I'm trying to create a format like uh, our certification courses. So Daniel, as and, and I know you work for a company that makes uh, ability thought industries that give a, have a platform that allow you to deliver courses. So I'm sure you've got some strong opinions about what platform you could potentially use, but there's lots of platforms out there. Thought industries being, being one of them. Um, mm -hmm. any, any thoughts about that question beyond, I don't want to, you know, I want to be careful here. I want to respect that, you know, you work for a company that does this and I know there's a million, trust me, I know there's a million competitors or potential other options that you could choose from. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, th I think the important thing is that um, that the answer is yes, there there are definitely um, a wide variety of platforms uh, and and uh, for, for you to leverage um, and and create learning experiences, lessons, courses, micro learnings and to deliver them um, in multiple channels, not just, um, you know, I think conventionally we think about the academy. Um, and you know the the academy is a really um, uh, important and awesome channel. It's where I really got my start in customer education. An academy is something that usually lives outside of your product, and 
where customers go to enroll in courses, to maybe get certified, to really sort of develop mastery in your product. Um, but I think, you know, uh, as, as technologies get more sophisticated, creating these learning experiences in, in a platform like Thought Industries, um, you know, we'll have the, we'll, we'll, we'll see more and more the ability to distribute that content in all sorts of different ways, not, not just really expect customers to leave your product in order to learn about your product. So, um, you know, I, I actually love the, the idea of, of Camtasia, like just sort of, you know, some, I, 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 I might be like just sort of dreaming here, but like, you know, you, you're, you're in your learning platform, you want to create a video, like you click the Camtasia button and you sort of like create that video and then you click the launch, launch this video button and then in, you can distribute that video. I, I just love the idea of technology all coming together. And um, I think that, you know, as you, it, it's, it's inevitable, I think, as this, this industry matures and we, we collectively as a community become more sophisticated that we're going to see more and more integrated systems, more and more systems talking to each other, software integrated and talking to each other. Um, just as, just like you're seeing with Asana right now, there's a tons of different, I used to work at Asana and like Asana's changed a lot. And just in the last couple of years, you can, it's really a hub to go. It's integrated with so many different platforms and you can do all your work right there. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping for a similar experience with learning platforms in the, in the short future. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, just my answer is that if you want to create that type of an experience, if you want to mimic what, like what we've done with our certifications, Go find a platform that's going to allow you to deliver that, and you're going to find a variety depending on what size enterprise, what size group you are. Um, but a lot of them, there's a lot of great options out there. Uh, but I, I love this notion of bringing it into go be where your customers are, be where they at that point mm -hmm. of need. To me, seems like the most exciting thing is because uh, if if they don't know I have an academy or a platform to go look at and they just ignore it, right? Like they don't know to go look for it. But if it's right there at that point of need, uh, to me, that seems like the, the, the best option, help them kind of in the moment. So we'll, we'll definitely, and it goes back to one of the, the key challenges we were talking about, you know, that that is another one that I've heard many times. And I think that both you and I can relate to It's you, you may have a, an incredible team creating incredible content and, um, and still have a really big problem uh, in that none of your customers are actually consuming your product. They're, they're not engaging with it for, what, for one reason or another. And so I think we need to acknowledge that, you know, we're, we're not doing compliance training here. Um, we're not, we don't have managers telling their direct reports, you need to do this training all the time. Um, we're not asking customers to go to school and be like in a classroom and dedicate time to learning. So it's unrealistic for us to expect that customers are, are going to take time out of their busy schedules to step away from their work and carve out time to learn about this product. I mean, some of them absolutely do. And I, I think, um, you know, God bless them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, I, you know, I, I really think that in the future, it's really the, the onus is on us as customer education professionals and particularly on us as customer education vendors to really find ways to help customer education professionals deliver that content in the moment of need so that we're not asking customers to um, stop what you're doing, go over here and learn about what you're doing and then come back and do what you're doing. But rather like while you're doing this thing, you can learn about this thing as well. It should all be sort of like right there in the moment of need. Yeah, makes makes total sense. Well, Daniel, I want I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about a video because I know you've had some interesting experiences that we've 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 talked about a little bit of them. Um, so we'll start kind of high level here first. I'm I'm curious, just generally your, because and look, I want to just for our audience, uh, we don't bring guests on because they're necessarily experts at one thing or another thing. We we you know we focus on their thing. Um, and I don't know what Daniel's going to say to the answer to this question. So it's, I'm not trying to just like, oh, well, he's going to say all the things we like. But here's the, the question <laughs> I really have, Daniel, is, is you know, I, you, I know you use a variety of different tools and have a, a variety of different methods for putting out customer education and working with your teams to put out customer education. 
but I, I'm really curious, what, what role do you think video has in that toolbox? Because, and I also don't think, you know, video is the only answer here. Um, mm. But I, I'm curious from your perspective, as someone who's, you know, that's not your primary thing. Like that's, I, of course I talk about video all the time. It's my, the thing we do, the text message thing. But I'm really curious from someone who has a much kind of ver wider variety of tactics and tools that they've used. What's what specifically job? Speaking of what at the top, you talked about jobs to be done. What job does video have to do in customer education in your mind? Yeah, so uh, you're right that video, specifically video, is is not necessarily my thing. Um, I would say my thing really is like uh, customer education strategy, learning strategies, um, and. Um, you know, Thought Industries developed this customer education playbook, which is a, a methodology in, in uh, ex developing and executing and measuring a customer education strategy. And um, it's a 12-step methodology, 12-step framework. And one of those steps, um, step five, is um, identifying the, the optimal format um, for this education. And so when I think about video, I think about it as a, um, as you said, really, it's like a, it's a tool. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's part of my tool belt. It's one of those formats that I, that I, I personally really enjoy um, leveraging and I have leveraged video in many different ways um, in many different programs. Um, I, the, I think one of the reasons why I love using video is because I, I have a very strong bias towards modular content strategies. So I really want to create a, um, a piece of content that is super flexible, um, is super focused on one, like a really like one learning objective, but if, if not one, then maybe one or two, but it's really, really simple and focused and is modular enough to be able to use um, across many different channels, um, call this an omni-channel modular content strategy. Um, and so you can use this particular piece of content in a greater, connect it with other pieces of content in a greater learning path. You can um, surface it in a um, social media campaign uh, or in your marketing channels. You can um, place it in a support article, embed it in a support article, or even uh, surface it in product in, in that just-in-time moment and so um video provides a really powerful uh way to be able to uh, to execute a modular content strategy like that and so um i definitely leverage it quite a bit i, I usually like to keep videos pretty small um and uh, we use videos to in, in one of two different ways mostly one will do sort of tutorial videos that really help um, model procedural knowledge, um, how to do this particular thing, step one, do this, step two, do that, in a way that might be difficult to convey in an article. Um, so there's sometimes there's levels of complexity um, that require you to really show that, um, that an animated GIF, for example, won't, won't quite do the trick. Um, <clears throat> and the other, the other way that I really like to use video is, is sort of like explainer videos that really surface the value of, um, of, of something. So we, we recently did this uh, series at Thought Industries called um, Feature Spotlight, which is you know these two minute videos that really spotlight a specific feature of Thought Industries, but doesn't actually ever show the product um, because we know our product changes and we don't want to have to revisit the video and maintain it and change it every time our product changes. And really the focus isn't on the product. It, the focus is on the value proposition of this particular feature and how it will help you do a job or, or solve a problem. And so we use these videos um, as part of our learning paths in the academy. We put them in our product. That was the, the videos I've been talking about it and where we put in our dashboard to close the consumption gap. Um, we feature it on our website uh, as a marketing material, um, social campaigns. It has a lot of different, it fits in a lot of different holes. And um, so I'm always looking for ways to sort of make content, in particular video content, stretch um, in as many use cases as possible. 
Well, I, I love that because it goes back to that those intersections we talked about earlier, right? That the these videos that you're making, they obviously clearly have a customer education purpose, but you're able to use it in so many different places. I mean, that that takes that one piece of content and just makes it so much more valuable, it seems, because instead of having to figure out, well, what are we gonna put on the marketing page? What are we gonna put in the product? What are we gonna put in the academy? You're making probably, I'm assuming just it's one thing that's just the, without even any changes, but repurposed across those mm -hmm. different things. So that makes so much sense. And, and of course, it's so interesting to me that, you know, one challenge when we talked about like challenges and things like that, I think one of the challenges that comes up in my mind, and maybe it's not the biggest one, but especially with uh, software as a service company or SaaS companies, product is always changing. Like even as a company, mm -hmm. we have desktop products that, that we do major releases at this point once a year. And we have you know other releases throughout, so minor changes, but big changes happen once a year, and it's like it's hard to keep up with the yeah. content. It's hard to make it, it definitely is. You know how do you keep it? How do you keep it fresh? How do you keep it relevant? So I love that idea that you're taking this and you're explaining the benefits of whatever that feature is without having to necessarily. It's not because it's not about how do you do it. It's yeah. about what it does. And sometimes it you know, and sometimes it it means that we need to um, to create a new piece of content. Um, as we did with many of uh, with the the feature spotlight videos, which you know we had this template. It's got like a intro and an outro, and um, then we do we have the music for it. And so it's um, so that's definitely something we'll continue to create new feature spotlight videos to really focus on um, big splashy new features that we launch. Um, but we also you know I, I would encourage if you're if you don't have the means to or you think it might slow you down to create a bunch of new videos. Um, take a look at content that already exists and figure out how to potentially repurpose that content. So we, we as an example, we run this um, weekly office hours program that started um, with COVID just as a way to really help our customers, um, you know, get more value from our, from our product. Um, it was a, it's a weekly hour long session hosted um, by um, a couple people and they really focus on, during that hour on um, how, like solving a specific problem using our platform. So after we did this for several different weeks, I think like by the time we had like 20 of these different hour long videos, we really started thinking, gosh, there's just so much content. And these are like hour long pieces of content. Um, what can we do to like really create more, um, like really create this content, create content or use this content in a way that makes it more modular. Um, so we went back through all of these videos and we sliced and diced it and we created what we call the office hour replay videos, which are really short, super highly focused segments that have an intro and an outro focused on a specific, um, very, very narrow uh, specific topic. Um, and now we have like hundreds of those videos that we can we can pull from that library and and make that part of the you know the the broader modular content strategy if we wanted to put that in a learning path or if we want to put that in a marketing channel um there's lots of ways that you can use that content and that was already content that's been produced so we didn't really have to do much just to i mean i say not much it did take quite a bit of time editing that video but um that's you know that's that's something that um uh, paid off in, in, in many different ways now that we have all those, those new replay videos. Yeah. Videos, videos never free of work, but it probably saves, uh, you know, it's not like creating all new videos for all those content. Uh, actually we yeah. have a, a, an episode of the podcast so for anyone that's listening that if you want to more learn more about repurposing Amy Woods from Con a company called content 10 X talked to us about the, that very idea. And I, and I, I love it because I know it's, it's something that's so important, especially when you're making, you know, we do that with this show, right? We will take this and we'll break out some of the snippets and we'll, you know, we'll turn it into a blog post. We'll take this one piece of content. We'll fuel 20 different pieces of content that our marketing team can use that, you know, we can put in very different channels. So I, I, I love that. Daniel, you shared with me a, a couple of different experiences you've had with video. And one particular is you've talked about the role of talking heads. Would you mind sharing mm -hmm. that story that of how, how talking heads have impacted your, some of your videos in the past? And, and we'll just caveat that people's experiences may vary, but I, I, I just sure. thought it was so, so interesting to hear that again, cause I love it's about experimentation. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, I, uh, 
we we were we were um so when i when i first got started in customer education i was at optimizely and um i was the, the I, I was the manager of our, our academy and our certification programs and um you know we had all these courses in our, our academy all these learning paths that we were created that we were creating and we were really really excited about the content um but we were always looking for ways to iterate you know we in fact we actually had a meeting every week called iterate with like five different exclamation marks. And it was really just about looking at the data, looking at the surveys and just like tapping into our own intuition and our own expertise to really figure out how we can um, make this content even better. And um, at some point we were like, you know, these, uh, these, these, the, the content sort of like just gets right into the topic. The, the courses just get right into the topic. Wouldn't it be great if we had a um, if we created these these talking head bumper videos for all of our learning paths that really uh, for all of our courses rather um, that really um, helped uh, the learner understand what this course was about why this topic is really important um, what they're going to learn in this course and just make it more personable I mean you could use like a course detail page with bullet points to do something similar but we really wanted to kind of it would serve a couple purposes. We wanted to, um, you know, thinking about Gagne's first step, we really wanted to like hook the audience and, and maybe use storytelling as part of this. Um, we wanted to make it more human and more personable. Um, we wanted, you know, and an intro video is also a way for us to be able to um, set up the topic in a way that's really difficult to do um, in just like text. And so, we we shot two full days of um, these video bumpers where this um, um, video producer came and, and we set up a little studio and um, there were like four of us who were narrators for these video these video bumpers and we shot them all in two days and there were like I think forty of them um, and just pop pop them in at the beginning of the course and um, it's it's something you can watch before you get started with the course. Also, SE, it's also like something you can find if you search out the course and it's not actually, you don't actually have to enroll in the course to watch it because it kind of sets up the course. And um, what did we find? Well, uh, we actually, not to, to no surprise, honestly, because I had a really deep intuition about this, um, but we found a lot more engagement with our courses. A lot more people um, enrolled in the course after we added these video bumpers. And that was the only change we made was we just added the video bumpers and we saw course enrollments go up. So that was a really, um, I think, strong signal to us that that they were working, um, that they really helped our customers um, feel like, OK, what is this course? What's it going to help me to do? And um, maybe we even got them a little excited about the content. Maybe we kind of I think some of our videos were designed to be like cliffhanger ish, you know. Um, so um, so, yeah, um, I think it was a real success for us. I love talking head videos, Matt. I think they're really awesome. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I always advocate, I, I, I'm of the camp that you should think about talking head videos as a way to introduce your courses. Well, I mean, I, I think it speaks to so many things that we've talked about on this show and in our, the TechSmith Academy and stuff that I think there's a lot of people who that's, that's not, they're like, no, I don't, we don't want to, I don't want to be on camera. I don't, you know, and it's, and it's hard. I get like, not everyone wants to be on camera, but I, I love that you were able to have that intuition and then you were able to put it into practice and to see that spike. And, and again, you know, results may vary depending on how people do it and set it up. But I, I think it's, it's so interesting. Um, in fact, uh, I know Jesse just put this in one of the chat, uh, that next week's guest is he is going to be talking about some of that experience that he's had with, you know, using, using people and connecting with people and allowing us to, you know, like that reason for hooking people and reasons to give them, what you're going to talk about because you know you set the expectation and even data that we have says that one of the number one reasons people stop watching videos is because uh, it doesn't feel relevant to them or they don't think it's relevant mm -hmm. and so I'm imagining this video with you Daniel talking about like here's what we're going to be talking about here's why it's so important to know about and you're doing exactly that allowing them to see that that relevant so um, that's exactly why we did it. Yep, that's exactly why we did it. And if you wanted to know what they look like, actually, I would I would encourage you all to visit the Optimizely Academy. Um, and uh, it's we designed the academy for, at Optimizely to not be behind a sign-in wall. You only have to sign in to take like the exams and earn the certifications, but all the content is free. 
Um, and you'll see all of our, our little bumper videos there. So you can watch them if you want. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to go. Everyone go check out Optimize Lee's Academy. That would be awesome to check check out. I have, I have one more question before we get to our speed round questions, Daniel. Um, and we're going to shift gears just a little bit here. Uh, because in your bio, and, and you and I have talked that you have been a game designer. And I'm just really curious about the, the game design that kind of maybe the influence or impact that that, that has had on your thinking about customer education. You know, we hear a lot about gamification, mm. lots of kind of things that you could do. Uh, maybe it's about that, maybe it's helped in that way, but I'm, I'm just from your kind of perspective, has that, that, that game design background been applicable to what you do in customer education? What a great question. Um, I, I actually, you know, the, the way, I, I think the answer is yes, maybe. Um, e either, um, game, my experience in game design has really had a really big impact on how I think about customer education, or um, I have a way of thinking that can that sort of facilitated um, game design and learning experience design. Um, uh, because I, one thing I will mention is that I, um, I, I tend to think a lot about the end user experience and about how the learner um, is really experiencing um, the content and and how um, how engaged are they? Are they feeling bored? Are they you know are they um, are they feeling like this is super relevant to them? And so I'm just you know I'm thinking a lot about that in user experience. Um, user experience broadly is really important in, in when I'm thinking about designing um, designing learning. And so um, that obviously that was something that I thought a lot about in, in designing games as well um, is, you know, we, we did a lot of um, a lot of experiments in our game design studio around how to make games more engaging, how to keep people from coming back over and over and over again, day after day after day. Um, and, you know, we also had to create tutorials. I mean, if you ever want to kind of have a nice sort of um, a very similar experience to designing training, but not quite. Um, try thinking about how you would design a tutorial for a game. It's a really interesting exercise. Um, so we, you know, we, you know, how do you design a tutorial in a way that that scaffolds the mechanics of the game, but also gets someone plugged into the story and gets them to come back for day two of the game. So um, yeah, all of those experiences I think have really contributed to my the way the sort of the questions I ask when I design learning is really like. How can um, how can I you know get drive more engagement? How can I make this more fun and more delightful? Um, and how can I get learners to want to come back for more? And those are also the the metrics that I feel really passionate about too. Is like, do customers um, rate this experience really highly in terms of how satisfied are they? Are are they on average how many um, pieces of content are, is one particular learner consuming? Um, are they coming back um, over you know 30 days period? How how often are they coming back? Um, and how does our new traffic compare to returning traffic? So those those questions I think are really interesting to me. I think they tap into sort of my game design experience. Well, I, just for what it's worth, a lot of the things you said also kind of resonated with me from a video creation standpoint. Like you talked about story and and connection, and it's like. I, I feel like there's a lot of parallels going on here between probably just learning game design, video creation that are, are, are all really good. Well, thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to, we're going to jump into what we call our speed round. These are meant to be quick, uh, fast answers from you, Daniel. Some of them are a little bit more fun, but uh, we'll, we'll kick it off. Got my our, coffee ready. Our little, our little <laughs> intro here. Okay, Daniel, you've already talked that you're a game designer, so we're gonna nerd here for a second. What is your favorite class to play in Dungeons and Dragons? I know you don't <laughs> you probably lead the game, you're a dungeon master, but if you get to play, what's yeah. your favorite class? When I play, I really like to play uh, sorcerer. Um, I, I like the idea, the story elements of being sort of born with power coursing through my blood. And um, so for whatever reason, I just really am drawn to the sorcerer class. You got to get that wild magic. Crazy things can happen. <laughs> <laughs> totally. 
So, yeah, so, you need a good DM in order for that to happen. But. Oh, oh yes, uh, absolutely. What's your favorite? Again, kind of, we're like I said, we'll have a little fun here first. Favorite strategy game to play? You, you mentioned to me that you know you designed a lot of strategy games. So, is there one that you like? You look to and it's like this is a strategy game that you just love. Yeah, I mean, I I, uh, I was really into Magic: The Gathering for a really long time. Um, I, I don't actually play it a whole lot anymore, but it it played a really big. Uh, it was a really big influence in the games that I designed. Um, uh, they were collectible card strategy games um, that that were played um, online. And um, I think, like you know, recently I've I've been more into um, in terms of strategy games. I've um, I play uh, a game, uh, another collectible digital collectible card game called Hearthstone. Um, yeah. it's one of the few games that my husband loves to play as well. So we play that game together all the time. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Yeah. Uh, so okay, so this is maybe a little tougher one, but what's the next big thing for customer education? What are we gonna? What's the one big thing? You don't have to justify yeah. or quantify it. <laughs> Just. I think the, I think you know that when I think about the the one big thing, um, it's really about um, being able to going back to what I was saying earlier, being able to connect uh, the impact of the work that you're you're doing to the business, um, being able to distribute your content more broadly into uh, the moment of learning. Those are the really two things that stand out to me the most. Is is what like I'm particularly thinking about as, as our industry evolves that we'll see. Um, a lot of, of movement in those areas. Perfect. So what's thinking of, again about customer education, what's one skill everybody working in customer education needs to have? Um, I don't know if this is a skill or maybe a quality, um, but I think that um, if you are not a curious person um, and if you are, if you don't have the skill to ask the right questions and do sort of discovery, then I think you're going to really have a lot of difficulty in the customer education role uh, because learning, um, you know, is about discovery and is about being curious and answering, get, you know, asking questions and finding information that answers them. So, you know, I, I think you have both the quality of curiosity and then the skill of discovery and, ans and, and asking the right questions. Yeah, another another great answer. So maybe well, one more on the customer education theme. What's the best customer edu education experience you've had that wasn't with a company you worked for? <coughs> and if you don't want to name names, that's fine, but you maybe can share just a little piece of that experience either way. Um, okay, sure. Um, I think that uh, a really, uh, well, um, TechSmith is a really great customer education <laughs> program. I really Let me get out my I wallet really like... right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll Venmo you. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's, it's funny because I, I do think about like the, the companies that I've, that I personally use that have sort of like done not just product training, but best practices training. So uh, TechSmith is, is one, Wistia is one. Um, and, you know, um, I have like great respect for some customer education programs that are sort of revolutionary in terms of how they started thinking about engagement, like Trailhead, for example. But, you know, full disclosure, I, I'm not a big Salesforce guy and I, I don't really haven't really needed to like dive into Trailhead. So I sort of admire it from afar, from like a from a learning perspective, I admire it, but I, I haven't really like um, had to learn Salesforce as much. <laughs> yeah, so. no. Well, well, first of all, thank you so much for the, you know, we, we appreciate, if you're putting us up in there with Wistia and, you know, we'll take that as a, a heartfelt compliment. So thank you. Um, <laughs> so going to your game design, what's one game mechanic that we should be, uh, that, uh, we should learn to use, uh, if we're making some kind of customer education? Ooh, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, <sighs> You know, I, I talk a lot about, I, I have this like presentation I do on game, gamification where I really, um, my, my position is that um, you, you shouldn't be really thinking about the mechanics, um, but rather you should be thinking about, um, uh, about design and about motivation, designing for motivation. And, and then allowing the mechanics to support the, the um, sort of thesis you have around what will best motivate this particular audience. Um, so, you know, I, 
the easy answer would be like yes in the in the world of customer education if done correctly um there uh, to show uh progress a visual sort of indication of progress can be a really powerful way of engaging um customers through a learning path or when you get to the end granting some sort of uh, reward like a badge or something like that can mm -hmm. be very powerful if done strategically. So those are sort of mechanics that come to mind, but even those can fail if you don't really have in mind your motivational strategy at the very outset. So design thinking is something I would encourage you to think about the most before you think about the mechanics. Perfect. I, I love that answer. And I'm just glad you didn't say worker placement. <laughs> the worker placement <laughs> mechanic. Might not work so well, but maybe it would, who knows? Okay, last question, and it's a little bit of a, a flip here for you. What's a question you'd like to ask me? Ooh, um, okay, here's, here's a, a question for you. What, um, you're, you guys are in the, the, video, um, the video business, um, so I would love to know a little bit about your thoughts on um, what you think is the best short um, short form video, um, like animated video or some sort of like, uh, I want to go, I want to take, I want to take an action here and like leave this and go watch something that takes me less than 10 minutes to finish and be like, yeah, that was really good. Gosh. So, so, I mean, I hate to go with the depends, it, but I think if you're, if you're going to think about creating whatever type, I think let the, let the type be dictated by the content and let the type be dictated by what you're trying to accomplish. Um, so for instance, if, if there's a reason, if it's going to be more lecture style, like maybe animation could be really good with that because then you can do more with it than maybe just a, you know, boring talking head. Right. But as you talked about talking head has its place. Um, so I have a, like from a form factor content form factor, I don't know if there's a good answer. Like I think it, it you could, there's so many good answers that you could do. It just so much depends on the content, but let the content really dictate what you're going to do. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, and so yeah. it's like, cause I, you know, from a text perspective, of course, I'd love to say screen recording, screen recording. But if you're showing software, you're showing something on your screen and that makes sense. Absolutely. If you're trying to show well, something I, co complicated, do something different. I, I was wondering like, you know, like, is, is there an animated short that you really like? for example, um, one that will make me laugh or make me cry. <laughs> okay. Anime short. Uh, do you know, so I, with four kids, I've watched a lot of Pixar. Everything they do is super <laughs> amazing. Um, yeah. You know, the, the, the one that just makes, I, I love the one with the volcano singing. It's a little bit sad. And then you're like, Oh, okay. he, the volcano finds his love. I can't remember the name of it. I'm sure someone on okay. the internet I'll, knows I'll, it. I can Google search Pixar animated volcano singing. Um, there's another Pixar one that I really liked that was like, it, I remember it was like a puppy related one that, that really just like touched my heart. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I just love puppies. So, you know, it's, um, it's longer form, but a great, well, since we're talking vi video now and movies, uh, it's animated. If you're talking, we want animated. It was on Netflix. Uh, Miller's versus the Machines. It's a. It's about mm. an hour and a half. It's really interesting animation. Like obviously computer generated animation. Uh, it's a really kind of interesting twist on a family of you know, kind of just a normal, really a normal family, and their dynamics with kind of. So there's probably some social commentary in there. I won't get into because I don't think I necessarily know what it is. But uh, it was just really fun. Like. My, my kid, my youngest is nine, was like, I want to watch this. Like, sure. You know, I'm like getting the phone out, getting ready to do something else. And I ended up putting my phone down, just enjoying a good laugh, like laughing awesome. out loud kind of movie, you know, 90 minutes or so. So it's not short form, but uh, definitely worth okay. taking in. I'll, uh, de I'll definitely go watch that. Um, did you, have you seen Invincible? Invincible. I don't know if I have, because the it's name's a, not ringing a bell. It's a it's another animated um, series. Um, 
about superheroes. Um, really, really awesome, um, but not one that I would recommend you watch with your kids. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Well, well, thanks. Thanks for the warning. Well, well, Daniel, thank you so much for spending some time with me today. It is always a pleasure to chat with you. It's been great to get to know you a little bit better, to hear from you and learn from your experiences. Uh, if anyone wanted to connect with you or, or learn more about Thought Industries, either one, where, where would you want them to go? Two places. Feel free to connect with me on uh, LinkedIn, um, uh, Daniel Quick's LinkedIn slash Daniel Quick. Um, and uh, you can also connect with me on the customer education Slack channel. Um, I hang out there a lot. Um, you can find that at customereducation.org. Um, and if you're part of the community, um, feel free to send me a message at any time. Perfect. Well, Daniel, thank you once again. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. And for everyone that's watching, if you want to hear more great conversations, go check out the podcast. Go watch us on YouTube. Go like, subscribe, leave us comments. You can always email us at thevisuallounge at techsmith.com. We're happy to answer your questions, take suggestions, and you know we'd love to hear what you think of the show. So with that said, we have a great guest next week, Jonathan Halls. He is he's Australian. He's worked for the BBC, and he is super knowledgeable about learning science and creating instructional content. And he'll be on, and we've it's it's just a wonderful conversation. It's actually heads up, it's a pre-recording because guess what, guys? I'm actually gonna take a vacation after like a year. So we'll see you all next week. And so grateful that you've been here. We'll see you next time.